Okay, let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 33. It's page 92 of the notes. And uh, we're jumping into the middle, uh, not only the middle of, of an event in the book of Acts, but in the middle of a point of the outline. So we really need to uh, back up. What's happening in Acts 13, Paul and, and uh, his companions, traveling companions, Barnabas and Mark, John Mark, are on what's called Paul's first missionary journey. It's the first of three. Uh, they got in a ship in the northern part of uh, north of Israel near Antioch, and uh, they got on a ship and they sailed to Cyprus. They preached all around Cyprus and then they got in a ship again and went to what today is the southern coast of Turkey. And they landed at a city called Perga. They uh, did some ministry there, but then quickly, uh, with, without a whole lot of explanation as to why, uh, there are some guesses that uh, there were some health issues with Paul and so on, and, and they left that area, which is a swampy kind of unhealthy area, went up mountains to uh, a place called uh, Antioch of Pisidia. And that's where they are, where we come to Acts chapter 13, verse 33. On the first, first Sabbath day of their time in Antioch of Pisidia, they went to the synagogue. And uh, there Paul was invited to speak, and he begins to preach about Jesus. And uh, so we're in the middle of that sermon. It's the first recorded sermon of Paul. Uh, that we have in the New Testament, and uh, it, is, it is a great, great thing uh, to read. So looking at our outline, we had number one, an eager audience, chapter 13, verse 14 through 16, they're in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Number two, sharing the glorious workings of God, verses 17 to 22. Number three, sharing the glorious Savior, verses 23 to 25. And then the resurrection, crucifixion, or the, excuse me, the rejection, crucifixion and resurrection, uh, chapter 13, verses 26 to 37. So that's the section that we're in. And let's back up to verse 29, and I'll, I'll just read those verses we already covered getting up to verse 33. So beginning in verse 29. And when they had carried out all that was written of him. So remember, this is a sermon we're jumping into the middle of. And Paul is talking about what happened with the rejection of Jesus the Messiah and crucifying him. So when those who crucified Jesus and accused him and so on, when they had carried out all that was written of him, all the prophecies of the crucifixion that were fulfilled when Jesus was crucified and he died, they took him down from the tree and they laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. That's the great news that he was resurrected. And uh, verse 31, and for many days, which was 40 days, he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And you could go all around uh, uh, the land of Israel still at this time and find uh, people who had witnessed the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. They were, most of them were still living. Verse 32, and we bring you the good news, and good news is what the word gospel means, that what God promised to the fathers, now here's where we start tonight, this he has fulfilled to us, their children. So promise to the fathers, that's the previous generations of Jewish people who had received the prophecies of the Messiah and then read the prophecies that uh, earlier had been written and so on. Well, those prophecies are now fulfilled to their children. In other words, the generation of Jewish people that were living in Jesus' day. That is going to be the first generation to personally know the blessings of experiencing the promises that were promised about the Messiah. 
of the previous generations, they were promises. Now this generation is the first one to, to experience them and so on. So that he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus as also it is written in the second Psalm. Now the second Psalm is one of the great uh, messianic psalms in the book of Psalms. Some of those Old Testament psalms we call messianic psalms because they have a lot of prophecy in them about the Messiah. Psalm 2 is one of them. The first part of Psalm 2 speaks of the futile efforts of those who seek to throw off God's rule. And, and it's in general. It refers to all time. But uh, in specific um, it is um, certainly what happened in Jerusalem when people rejected God's Messiah and in turn rejected God uh, himself. And the leaders conspired to do away with Jesus. And Psalm 2 talks about the leaders of the people uh, conspiring against God and so on. So that's the beginning of Psalm 2. Now the second part, the rest of Psalm 2, describes God as laughing at his enemies and is installing his anointed one as king. And in Hebrew, the word anointed one is Mashiach, from which we get Messiah, installing his Messiah as king. Now that is in fulfillment of unconditional promises that God made to King David. He said to King David that there would be a descendant of his who would reign forever and ever, and this would be the anointed one, the Mashiach, the Messiah, and he would reign eternally. But in order to reign eternally, since he has died, he is going to have to be resurrected. And if there is to be an installation or coronation ceremony for this king, he's going to have to be resurrected. So we then come to his quotation from Psalm 2. This is God the Father speaking to God the Son. You are my son. So God the Father is speaking to the one of whom it was prophesied in Isaiah 9, 6, that unto you a child is born, unto us a son is given. And that son is the very son of God the Father. Certainly not in a biological sense, but in the sense of, of two persons of the eternal Godhead and the roles of that they had. And so he's prophesying here by speaking God the Father to God the Son, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now this son is identified twice in the Gospels by God the Father speaking from heaven, once was at Jesus' baptism, where he said, you are my son in whom I am well pleased, and almost the same words at his transfiguration, both times in his life. God spoke from heaven, affirming that Jesus is his son. But now comes that promise, today I have begotten you. Uh, that does not mean that there was a time when God the Son didn't exist. That's how we think of that term in, 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 in human terms. We think of, uh, we have a child, that child didn't exist before they were conceived, but there came that day where they were begotten, where they were conceived. That's not what this is saying. That's not true of God the Son. But what it is doing, it's taking that word begotten at its literal meaning to give life, and in specific, to give human life. And so God the Father is speaking to the Son, who is eternal God, who is spirit, and says, in effect, you are going to take a body, and I will give you human life. Now, there are two um, 
uh, two important times in Jesus' life where this was fulfilled, where this happened. The first was at his conception, where he was given human life. Uh, that's referred to in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 to 6, quotes this idea in that regard. Sec the second time is at his resurrection, when his body died, his body was lifeless. And a second time, God the Father gave him human life when he raised him from the dead. That is what is specifically being referred to here, is this resurrection. Now, there has for centuries in the world been a false teaching, you, you certainly can call it a heresy, it's called Arianism. And one of the things about Arianism is they teach that this verse says Jesus was created. But Acts 13.33 and Hebrews 1 verses 5 to 6 show that Psalm 2 is not talking about that he at a point was created, but that the eternal son was given human life. Now the Arians, uh, hundreds of years ago in church history, arose with this heresy. Their, their, their leader, their spokesman, was a man named Arius, and so that's why we call them Arians. Arians are still around today, but you never hear them called Arians, and, and they wouldn't even know what the word Arian means, most of them probably. But uh, today, for instance, Jehovah's Witnesses are Arians. They perpetuate that, that heresy that Jesus is created. And they would appeal. If they come to your house and have a Bible study and get on to that subject, they would appeal to Psalm 2. But again, Acts 13 and Hebrews chapter 1 put it, Psalm 2 exactly in the context of what it means. The resurrection and, and the uh, virgin conception of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is an important verse. And then verse 34, and as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. And here he quotes from Isaiah 55, verse 3. This is again the Father speaking to the Son. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. So that's a promise. Now, the idea of the holy uh, blessings of David. They, these promises or blessings of David are holy because they flowed from a holy God. And they are sure, he calls them holy and sure blessings. They are sure because they're permanent. No one can take them away. It's not like a dream that you see once and then it just kind of floats away and you never see it again. They are, they are solid, they are certain, they are sure, and they are the blessings of David. That is the promises that God gave to David, that a descendant of David's is going to reign forever and ever. Second Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 17 is one of the places where those promises are made. Now, that promise to, to David, if Jesus died and then remained dead, those promises would never be fulfilled. Therefore, Jesus had to be raised from the dead and, uh, and so on. And the dead Messiah couldn't have been the channel for these blessings of David. So, but that's not what happened. He didn't stay dead. He was raised. And that's what Paul is declaring here. So then he, in verse 35, says, therefore, he, that is God the Father, says also in another psalm. This time he's going to quote Psalm 16, verse 10. You will not let your Holy One see corruption. In other words, not only would Jesus' body be given life and raised from the dead three days after the crucifixion. But in those three days, his body wouldn't even begin the process of decomposition. 
bodies start that immediately after death. And the Jews did not embalm. And they all knew that by three days, they, you, you would start to see the effects of decomposition. But uh, Jesus' body was preserved from that because he was without sin. And the decomposition of the body is, is part of the effect of sin, but Jesus was without sin. And God the Father promised that uh, not only would he be raised from the dead, but he also would not see corruption. Well, verse 36, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. In other words, he died. There's that good word in the New Testament referring to the death of believers as falling asleep. It's the idea that the body falls asleep. Soul goes to be with the Lord, but the body falls asleep. Waiting for the resurrection, that's why it's called sleep, because there's a promise that it's going to wake up. Well, David fell asleep or died and was laid with his fathers and he saw corruption. So some people would have said, well, Psalm 16 is referring to David. And Paul is pointing out it didn't point, it did not apply to David because David's body saw corruption. And uh, his tomb was right there in Jerusalem for everyone to see. So verse 37, but he whom God raised did not see corruption. And you might underline the word not. Um, so tremendous, tremendous promise in those prophecies fulfilled in Jesus being raised from the dead. Well, turning to page 93, we have number five in the sermon, the forgiveness uh, to everyone who believes in Christ. Now he's getting to the point of the message, and that's in verses 38 and 39. So, verse 38, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, that is through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Forgiveness to a world that is plagued with guilt, people that are plagued with guilt. And they have no means of, of getting rid of that guilt. Even today, every, every year, the Jewish people have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And the day that looks back uh, to the Old Testament Day of Atonement, which looks forward to the coming of Christ when our sins would be atoned for and there would be forgiveness. But in, in Judaism, where they have not, uh, not accepted that, that uh, forgiveness through Christ, they are still, every Yom Kippur, they are dealing with their guilt. And the message is, you don't have to deal with your guilt anymore. That God has proclaimed forgiveness of sin, and it's proclaimed to you. It's proclaimed as a gift rather than something that you earn. Verse 39, and by him, that's Jesus, everyone. That everyone is referring to Jew and Gentile. Uh, the Jews in the audience would be very tied into the fact that only Jews get in on these blessings. And he says, but this is for everyone, Jew and Gentile, who believes, not keeps the law, not works, but believes, is freed from everything. So everyone and everything, two big words here. Everything means complete forgiveness. Our, our past sins at the moment of our salvation, those sins that we did in the past, those sins that we're doing right at the moment of salvation, and any sins that we will do after salvation, they are all forgiven, past, present, and future. The slate is wiped clean. It's a tremendous, tremendous promise. So everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Because he's saying this in the synagogue. 
to people who are very much involved with, well, we, we've got to make sure we, we keep all the laws, but not just, uh, not just the way that God said it in the Old Testament, but they have, they have developed all their rabbinic traditions where they added all their traditions to the law. And so we've got to keep all those too. And Paul is saying that's not where salvation is. It is in Christ. The law is a good indicator of guilt and to show us that we need forgiveness, but it is not a forgiver. And so he's speaking to people who have based their hope on forgiveness, on keeping the law. None of them have been able to keep it perfectly. So they, therefore, uh, they all have still that guilt of their sin. Paul, who is saying this, uh, wrote later on in the book of Philippians chapter 3 verse 6 about his life before he came to salvation in Christ. Paul said, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He said, I did my best to keep the law and to the, to the best of my knowledge. I did it. But I discovered that wasn't good enough. I needed Christ. So tremendous statement. Well, then number six, the judgment to avoid. And that's in chapter 13, verses 40 and 41. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets. And he's going to quote some prophets here. For instance, uh, Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk, warned his generation of an impending Babylonian invasion of Israel as part of God's discipline to Israel because of their sin. Isaiah, in his prophecy, warned of an Assyrian. The Assyrians were going to invade because of Israel's sin and many other prophets. But Habakkuk and Isaiah and all the other prophets looked ahead to a future a terror of destruction that was coming, and that is the Roman destruction in Jeru of Jerusalem that's going to occur in 70 AD. Now, that hasn't happened yet when Paul said this, and it's uh, going to happen in less than 40 years. And, and then on top of that, these prophets are looking beyond that to eternal judgment that will come on those who don't believe in Christ. So verse 40, beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. And now he quotes from the book of Habakkuk, who, told, uh, who, who was told by God, God told Habakkuk about this coming Babylonian uh, invasion that's going to destroy uh, the, the other nations or, 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 the, or destroy the Jewish people. But an interesting thing in Habakkuk's, in Habakkuk's uh, prophecy, prophecy, the book of Habakkuk, unlike the other prophets, he doesn't mention that destruction could be averted if the nation of Israel would turn to the Lord. He, he doesn't call for national repentance. Apparently, he believes it's too late. But he does promise that there will be deliverance for individuals who put their faith and trust in, in the Lord, who come by faith. And Habakkuk is the source of that wonderful verse that is found three times in the New Testament, the just shall live by faith. He's giving in Habakkuk 2.4 this personal invitation to individuals that they can, they can come by faith and be delivered from the wrath to come, which is the wrath of God's judgment. So he's going to quote from Habakkuk here. And so in verse 40, uh, look, you scoffers, and this is from Habakkuk 1.5, Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days. What is the work? The work is judgment. A work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. So Paul gives them that quote, which the Jews among them would have been familiar with, to remind them that there is judgment to avoid if they would personally believe 
Uh, it, it's, um, he's not dealing with a national repentance of the whole nation, but with them as individuals. That brings us to number four in the outline. Uh, the other points, five and six, were part of the breakdown of the content of the sermon. Now going back to the events of that day, number four, there's a strong reaction to God's word. And that's in verses, or chapter 13, verses 42 to 52. First of all, the word of God is received by Jews. And that's in verses 42 and 43. Look at verse 42. As they went out, the people, uh, uh, not the leaders of the synagogue, but these are the people, the uh, common, ordinary Jewish members in the audience. They begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. Now, in the next verse, we are going to have an indication that they had believed the message in their heart. We would say they have been converted. Um, we wouldn't know that yet, except that it's going to come out in the next verse. But what we have here. The fact that they are begging that things might be continued to be told them next Saturday is uh, that's part of the fruit of believing, is a hunger for more of God's word. Over in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, uh, Peter talks about like newborn babies just long for milk, can't get enough milk. So a newborn babe in Christ, believer in Christ, longs for the milk of the word. Well, that's what's happening here. There is this within them, this desire uh, to know more. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism, so in other words, Gentiles who had become Jews, followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. That's the clue that they have believed. If, if they weren't believers, he wouldn't ask them to continue in the grace of God. He would say, you need to be entering into the grace of God, but he's urging them to continue uh, in the grace of God. And um, so that is a, um, a tremendous, um, and turn the page, by the way, to... Uh, page 94, so we all stay on the same page, uh, about what's going on here with this continuing in the grace of God. Um, grace is a new concept for them. They've been in the synagogue constantly all their lives, and they've heard law, law, law. They have not heard grace, grace, grace. Now, grace is in the Older Testament, but they overlook it like... Um, about Noah. Noah found what? Grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Ah, that's grace, although the word grace isn't there. Years ago, there used to be a school next door. We shared the same parking lot. The school was eventually abandoned and uh, before the buildings were torn down, uh, we got to, to use a couple of the buildings and there was a Jewish group that got to use uh, even, even more of the school than we did. And the rabbi and I, and I had our offices in the same building. And the rabbi and I became friends. And um, I just, um, I, uh, you know, I was, I was, enjoying talking to him and so on, getting some insight. And one day I, I was reading in Proverbs chapter one, uh, verses eight and nine, and it talks about a garland of grace being on the wise person. And um, I, I was just wanting to know more about what was behind that, the idea of a garland of grace. And so, I asked Rabbi Bergman that. I, I wasn't doing that as kind of a stepping stone. I was not intending it as a stepping stone to then preach grace to him. I was just wanting to know what his concept of grace was. And when I asked that, he became very defensive. 
And I kind of went, ooh, you know, I touched a nerve. He just became very defensive. In Judaism, there is no concept of grace. I know you have that in Christianity, but we do not have that in Judaism. Well, I beg to differ with him. Um, and um, that's, that's a case like Paul talks about when the law is read, their, their eyes are blinded. But um, that is the condition that these people would have been in before God opened their eyes as Paul was preaching. And so grace is God's undeserved favor. It's not a reward for keeping the law. It's undeserved. And it is a dynamic force. It transforms believers' lives, beginning at salvation. We're saved by grace. And it continues that transformation of our lives in the process of sanctification as we are growing like Christ in our Christian life. And grace will see us all the way through to our glorification when we receive our glorified bodies. And so like the song says, amazing grace, and grace will lead me home. It's going to see us all the way through. And we've all received grace upon grace because John 1.16 says that uh, in Christ we have grace upon grace. So I, I put in your notes there um, the fact that the Bible teaches that those who are saved continue in the grace of God. Um, John 8.31 says, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. So... Um, those who are saved by grace will continue in that. 1 John 2.19 talks about uh, some, some, some antichrists, some false believers. It says, they went out from us. Uh, that is, they originally had said, oh, we're, we're part of you, we're believers. But he says, they went out from you because they were, they were not really of you. For if they had been of you, they would have continued with you. And then Colossians 1, 21 to 23 talks about that as well. So uh, when we begin in grace in our salvation, uh, one of the marks of our salvation is continuing uh, in that grace. And uh, to trust Jesus Christ alone uh, for our salvation. Sometimes you hear a person say, Oh, I was a Christian, but I'm no longer a Christian. Well, they're not continuing in grace. And that is an evidence that they are not a believer. Uh, sometimes um, you'll hear people say all kinds of things that are the opposite of what it means to, if they were continuing on in grace. So the command that he gives here to continue in grace is a command to do the things necessary to grow in grace. What are the things necessary to grow in grace? Well, being in the word of God. A person is not going to grow in grace who never opens their Bible. Uh, so that, that would be one. Prayer, being involved in prayer between us and God. A fellowship with other believers. Confessing our sin, all of these are means by which we grow in grace. So it's a tremendous uh, command that he gave them, continue in the grace of God. Well, then we have number two, the word of God is rejected by the Jews in verses 44 to 46. Verse 44, then the next Sabbath, almost the whole city uh, gathered, and that would be the result of the best advertising in the world, and that is one by one, one telling another person of what's happened in their life. That advertising goes a lot farther than all the ads that you could ever see, and that's what's happened here. So uh, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Uh, that phrase, the word of the Lord, is is going to be repeated in verse 46, although there it uses the term word of God, and then it's going to be in verse 48 and 49. Uh, our mission isn't to teach politics. It's not to preach social issues. 
And there are certainly a lot of social issues that are worthy of talking about and pushing. But that's not our, 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 our main responsibility. Our main responsibility is to preach and teach and proclaim uh, the word of the Lord. So they gathered to hear the word of the Lord, verse 45. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They're jealous over all the Jews in that congregation who used to look to them as the spiritual, uh, knowledgeable people. And now they're, they're, they're going after, uh, after Paul and following him. And probably they're jealous over so many Gentiles responding to Paul's message in large numbers. So they were filled with jealousy and they began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. So contradict, what would that be specifically? Undoubtedly, trying to contradict that Jesus is the Messiah. Trying to contradict that salvation does not come by uh, by grace, but instead comes by keeping the law. And uh, they're probably telling people, oh, Jesus was crucified as a criminal, and he was cursed by God, and he's not the son of God, and he's not born of a virgin. So they're, they're contradicting all these things spoken by Paul, and then they're reviling him, just uh, uh, ridiculing him and accusing him of whatever. Well, Verse 46, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Now he's speaking to them as Jews, as people in the synagogue. And he says, it, it was necessary when I came to this town that I spoke to you first instead of to the Gentiles. Why? He doesn't give any specifics, but we can understand that from other scriptures. Uh, for instance, um, because according to Romans 3, 2, the Jews were the recipients and the guardians of God's written word. They are the ones that received the Older Testament. And then later, uh, most of the New Testament was written uh, to a Jewish audience. And God gave the Jews opportunity to evangelize the Gentiles, which would fulfill the worldwide uh, commission that uh, God outlined for the Jews in Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 13, and Isaiah 49, 1 to 13. There was a commission that God gave to the Jews to evangelize the Gentiles. Now, they didn't do it. But Paul is saying, here's an opportunity where you can do that. You're, you're the first in Antioch of Pisidia to hear the gospel and come to salvation. You then can be involved in doing what God told you to do back in the prophet of Isaiah, which is to uh, give out the gospel. So be spoken to first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves, unworthy of eternal life. Now, we are all unworthy. None of us are worthy of eternal life. But he is saying, you judged yourselves unworthy. In other words, you proved that you are unworthy and that you wouldn't come to Messiah for salvation. So Paul says, so we are turning to the Gentiles. And that pattern happened over and over again in Paul's ministry. Went to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. So turning the page to page 95, we have number three. The word of God is embraced by the Gentiles in verses 47 to 49. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, and here he quotes Isaiah 49, verse 6. I have made you, that is Israel, a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of God and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Well, that's a wonderful statement. Now that statement 
has bothered some people. Many people try to skip over the statement. Some people try to change it to read, as many as believed, God appointed to eternal life, but that's not what it says. The appointment here is the appointment to believe. Now, we've already seen that the norm is that people reject God. And no one would be saved if God didn't make the first move. And this is saying, you are saved because God made the first move. Um, Other verses on that, John 6, verse 65, no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. There's Colossians 3, 12, where Paul described Christians as chosen by God. There's 2 Thessalonians 2.13 that says we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. So that idea is not just here. It is uh, in many other places in Scripture. And now some people say, well, if, if we're going to believe that and teach that, that's going to destroy our, our evangelistic ministry. It's going to stop people from going out and sharing the gospel. And it's, it's really the opposite because this statement occurs right in the midst of as evangelism is happening. It doesn't stop evangelism. It's part of evangelism. And some people would say, well, if God is going to save people anyway, why send missionaries? And some, there are people that say that's what this sounds like. Well, he's going to save people anyway. So if that's the case, why send missionaries? Well, the problem is the word anyway. That, that's the problem because God never said he would save apart from our witness. Uh, Back in Romans 10, there's a wonderful passage, talks, quotes the Old Testament, says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then it goes on, a wonderful section that says, well, how how are they going to call on one whom they've never heard about? How are they going to hear unless someone goes and tells them. That is the means that God uses. So he wants us to be going to everyone in the world and giving them the message that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And leave the results to God. God has said from his point of view, those whom he has appointed for salvation uh, will come. But we don't know who those people are. And so we are to preach to everyone, if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, there, 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 there is um, two tracks here. There is is the track of human responsibility. I've got to trust Christ. There is the track of of God's appointment. We'll never get it all figured out until we get to heaven, how that all comes together. But here is an example of the fact that it does. So it's a wonderful, wonderful verse on salvation. Well, continuing on uh, in verse 49, and the word of God was spreading throughout the whole region. And that brings us to number four, the word of God divided the city. Look at verse 50. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing. These are women who... um, were probably married. These are believing women. 
who are probably married to leaders in the community. Uh, and in, in that culture, in those days, women were held in low esteem. And this turkey had, had been swallowed up by the Greek culture in their religion. They had the Greek gods and goddesses and temples and so on. And, and in that kind of religion in those days, they believed that every man should have three women a girlfriend to accompany him to parties, a prostitute for his sexual pleasure, and a wife to bear his legitimate children and care for the home. I mean, that's, that's their position for women. And so in that culture, uh, many honorable women were drawn to Judaism. I'm talking about Gentile women were drawn to Judaism because it placed a higher value on women and held marriage in greater esteem. And these women, often the wives of judges and city officials, would come to the synagogues and be proselytized to Judaism. And that seems to be the kind of women that he's talking about here. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city. So again, these are the Gentiles, the judges, and the rulers of the city. Stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. They just got this thing going with these women and these men in positions of authority. They're probably saying things like, Paul is spreading an illicit religion. They're disturbing the peace of the empire. We're going to get the Romans mad at us. And they're going to bring, come in here with their soldiers. And let's just kind of forget all this stuff that Paul has been preaching. So in verse 51, but they, so that's Paul and Barnabas, shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. Now, where does this idea of shaking the dust off their feet come from? There was something in the Jewish culture that, that this comes from. Um, it was a Jewish tradition that when Jews went out of the land of Israel into a Gentile territory, when they came back and are about to cross the border into Israel, they shake the dust off their feet. They don't want to bring Gentile dirt into the Holy Land, into the promised land. Jesus applied that idea to treating Jews as Gentiles in Matthew 10, 14. Let me read uh, Matthew 10, 14. Matthew 10, 14. This was some words of Jesus to the 12 disciples, when he sent them out to preach among the Jews, 1014, if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. In other words, if they reject the message, you shake the dust off your feet, it's a symbol that you're treating these, Gen these Jews like Gentiles. They are in the position of a Gentile because they have rejected God's message. And so that's what Paul is doing here, is applying the words of Jesus. In effect, he's saying, you are worse than pagans. You have no part in God's salvation. And so they went to Iconium. It's another city in that, in that state, you might call it, uh, the area, which is all this is in the area of Galatia. Uh, that the book of Galatians was written to. He went to the city of Iconium. Iconium was a city 90 miles away. And there he's going to continue to preach. But look at verse 52. And the disciples. So there were people left behind who had become believers. And they are continuing in the grace of God. And you can call them disciples. They are learners and followers of Jesus. The disciples were filled with joy. 
and with the Holy Spirit. Instead of being absolutely devastated, because certainly this could not have been easy for them to see Paul and Barnabas leave, but they are filled with the Spirit and part of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. And so they are filled with the joy uh, and, the, and the Spirit uh, even as they're going to see some persecution because of their faith in Christ. Well, what a reminder to us of uh, our need to continue in the grace of God. And um, what, a, what a stirring story all of this is of Paul's faithfulness to do what God had called him to do. Well, that is a good stopping point, not only for tonight, but um, we will then, it's a good spot to pick up in about a month when I will resume, resume the book of Acts on Sunday nights. Well, let's pray. Father, how we do thank you for Paul and Barnabas and their faithfulness. They were they were opposed, they were persecuted. We're going to see it's going to get worse than that. Yeah, they're going to be stoned and left for dead. And so, Father, but they were faithful. And Father, we thank you for those believers in Antioch of Pisidia who believed and uh, had experienced your grace and continued in your grace. And we look forward to talking with them someday in eternity. But Father, we pray around the world today that your gospel of grace would be growing. And we pray for those places where there is great persecution, but yet there are some believers in every one of those places. And we pray that they would be uh, strong in you and your word would be, uh, be multiplied as a result of, of their sharing in their imprisonment and in their persecution. So Father, we thank you for our time to study this and we pray for your blessing later on as we resume this. But in the meantime, the new studies we're going to have on Wednesday night, commit them to you and thank you for all your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.